Namaste. So that's stable posture being acquired. The movements of inhalation and exhalation should be controlled. This is pranayama. This comes from the Yoga Sutra, Book 2, Sutra 49. It says, Tasman Sati, Swasya Prasvasayol, Jyati Vichedaha, Pranayamaha. So today we move into Pranayama. What is Pranayama? Well, Prana, as most of you know, can be thought of as the breath or respiration. According to the Upanishads, prana is the principle of life and consciousness. I'd like to think of prana as more than that, though. I'd like to think of it as the energy contained in the in-breath. So it's not actually the oxygen, right, that we're breathing in. It's more of an energetic force within the oxygen. It's what gives life to everything. Ayama means to stretch or extension or expansion. So the two of these together, together, prana and ayama, Iyengar says, is the prolonged expansion and restraint of the breath. So pranayama is the prolonged expansion and restraint of the breath. Pranayama affects rhythmic expansion of the lungs and increases the flow of blood creating proper circulation of bodily fluids within the kidneys, stomach, liver, spleen, intestines, skin, and other, dis and other organs. Pranayama is responsible for maintaining the rhythmic flow of blood. It tones the cardiac muscles, the nerves, the brain, and the spinal cord. Prana is present in all living beings. It cultivates pure consciousness or chitta. And when prana and chitta are balanced, the mind is still. If prana is irregular, then chitta cannot be controlled. Let's move now to puraka or the act of inhaling. Puraka stimulates the body and the mind. It connects us with divine consciousness. And if you'll just allow yourself now to breathe in and believe that you are divine consciousness, believe that you are divine spirit. So try it for yourself once again, breathing in, Believe that you are divine spirit. Breathing in. Believe that you are the essence of div divine spirit. So I love this. This to me is more than a breathing exercise. It truly is a mind exercise, isn't it? It, it truly is a shift of paradigm for many of us. Many of us lose sight of this connection between divine consciousness and spirit and our own spiritual being or our own physical, mental, spirit body. We lose sight of the fact that, in fact, we are all one, one with divine consciousness, one with divine spirit. So for me, when we think of the act of inhaling, if we can take this act alone, when we breathe in, to breathe in light and spirit of divine consciousness. This begins to take hold in the psyche in a deeper way even than the pranayama practice, in a deeper way than any exercise could ever bring. So this connection between mind and body and spirit, we hear it all the time. It's a little bit of a cliche in yoga. But really, it has its roots in the Upanishads. Remember, uh, the Upanishads were the end of the Vedantic period or the end of the Veda when 
people began to sit near their teacher or sit close to to hear of these teachings of yoga. And we can think of this passed down oral tradition as being a time when uh, yogis, lay people, began to realize that the universal self and the individual self were in fact one, that Brahman and Atman were one, not separate. So in this act of inhaling, if we can connect again to this divine consciousness, if we can connect again to the spirit of oneness, this is where I believe that pranayama takes its greatest inspiration or its greatest link to yogis of past. The Upanishads were written or they're a compilation of books or texts that were compiled somewhere between 1500 and 1000 before the Common Era. So if we think about the other great yogic texts that we have um, reviewed in yoga therapy here, We've talked about the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, and that was around 15th century. And the Yoga Sutras, somewhere around the 200th century. So these Upanishads go way back, 1500 years before the Common Era. It's this link to yogis of past, it's this link to divine consciousness, this connection that I think is most important when we breathe in. So let's take another moment, you and I, to slow down this breathing process. Let's take just one moment to connect with divine consciousness and say it to yourself time and again in your own mind, breathing in, I feel my connection to Divine Spirit. Just focus on the in-breath for now, breathing in, believe that you are Divine Consciousness. Trust and believe that in this act alone, you are connecting to yogis of past. In this act alone of breathing in, you are connecting to Divine Consciousness. So it's important as yoga therapy or therapist to be able to convey this simple, um, this simple tradition of yoga past that in fact we are all one and when we sit near either a great teacher or even when we sit near next to one of our clients that we are connecting with this divine consciousness and that we will be able to heal if we're able to connect with this spirit. This is what I hope that pranayama practice brings us. So, apana is downward flowing. Uh, you've learned that in our subdoshas. All of the subdoshas, apana is mostly downward moving. I'd like to offer that this is true except in relation to gaseous waste. When we inhale oxygen after it exchanges with the gases within the capillaries and the alveoli, this oxygen stays above the diaphragm in the lungs. It moves freely both downward and upward in relation to the waste it's moving. So, I want you to think of apana as the energy contained in the outbreath or in the movement contained in the outbreath. So if we think of prana as the energy contained in the in-breath and puraka, the actual act of inhaling, we're looking at apana as the energy contained in the outbreath, the waste that flows outward.
So when Apana is weak, we are susceptible to illness, fear, doubt, insecurity. When Apana is strong, Apana roots and grounds us. However, this constant downward flow of Apana for elimination can deplete us. Pranayama teaching us, teaches us to redirect Apana, to in fact redirect that vital essence of Prana within us. You'll learn as time goes on, or maybe you've already experienced it for yourself in your own Pranayama practice, that when we take breathing practice, it's more than breathing in, it's more than breathing out, and we've certainly learned in the last few moments that it in itself, the act of breathing in connects us to divine consciousness. But more than that, we're able to direct, redirect this beautiful, wonderful energy within us if we're only aware that we have this capacity to redirect this flow, redirect prana, apana. So it's not merely when you breathe out to exhale and push air outward. Or sometimes yogis even think that they have to push downward. We'll discuss bandhas in a moment. It's, it's really neither of that. It's really a connection and a redirection of the vital energy. So red chakra then is the act of exhaling. Red chakra cleanses and calms the body and the mind. And the act of releasing all of which does not serve you in the physical, mental, and spiritual plane. This is Rachaka. So now let's take a moment. I'd like you to just focus on the exhale. And think to yourself that you're releasing all that which does not serve you. Releasing all the physical toxins in the exhale. Releasing all the mental muck. Releasing all the spiritual doubt that may lie within. Know that this release is Rachaka. So do it a few more times. Breathe out consciously and tell yourself over and over again, I am releasing all that does not serve me. I am releasing all of the toxicity physically, mentally, spiritually. This is Rachaka. So Kumbhaka is the retention of the breath. Kumbhaka distributes prana through the body and the mind. It's the essence of pranayama since restraining the breath curbs the constant thought activity of the mind. If you hold your breath, there isn't much else you can think about. You might get nervous or you might think, I can't breathe. You might even think, I, I'm going to die. I can't do this. <laughs> but once you get adept at the practice of kumbhaka, you'll find that a gentleness enters into the mind, the body, the soul, the spirit. And that all thought activity ceases. And it's almost, I like to think of it as a deep sea diver. You know those divers that go deep into the, into the ocean without any oxygen? It's kind of like that, that deep stillness, deep softness. This is Kumbhaka. So let's take a moment. Excuse me, I'm going to go backward. And I'd like you to breathe in. Remind yourself that you are divine consciousness. Breathe out physically. Tell yourself in your mind's eye, I am releasing all that does not serve me. And on this exhale, hold just for a moment five counts. Four, three, two, and inhale soft and sweet. And exhale at your own pace. Now, kumbhaka can be held on the in breath, of course, or the out breath. You want to make certain that 
for instance, for evening practice, you wouldn't hold the inhale because prana can be pretty active. It can bring a lot of energy, can't it? Remember, the out-breath is cooling. So you'd mostly want an evening practice or for calming pranayama exercise to hold the exhale. But we're going to try the inhale as well. Let's start on the out-breath. Begin soft and slow. Exhale. Cleanse completely, body, mind, and spirit. And inhale. Bring in as much breath as you can bring in. And then hold the breath. Five. Three. And release softly. So you may have felt, I mean, that this was a small exercise, wasn't it? We didn't do uh, many um, cycles of this puraka, rechaka, kumbhaka. We just did one. But if, if you really were able to key into the prana, to the apana, maybe you were able to see that each of these energetic forces within you are powerful in their own sense. Maybe you felt that on that exhale retention, there was softness. Maybe you felt on that inhale retention that there was energy. I like to call it an energetic calm. So let's move on to the nadis. So nadi comes from the root nad, which means motion. There are 72,000 nadis. Some schools or camps will even say there's more than this, these different channels of the subtle body through which energy flows, through which prana flows, apana. Today we'll only focus on three. Ida, I call it Ida, Pingala, and Shishuna. So Ida, or Ida, begins from the junction of Muladhara Chakra and Shishuna Nadi. We've talked about it a little bit before, and this is the channel for the energy of Apana, this lunar energy. It also can carry Tamasic energy. Now remember, tamas, as you'll learn, if you haven't already, by someone more adept than I, a tool in uh, Samkhya, you'll learn that tamas is, is beneficial too, isn't it? Everything needs to sleep. And tamas can be thought of sometimes as being negative, but everything needs that little bit of a down cycle, that dark cycle, right? So I don't want you to think so much as Thomas as being negative. I just want you to think of Thomas, the mind energy, so to speak, the mind quality, to be something that's needed every now and then, to have this space of rest, darkness. Well, Ida, this ener energy channel, when purified, allows us to have a restful sleep. Ida, as you'll remember, is mostly on the left side of the body, the left nostril. Ida, when imbalanced, leads to deep attachment, rigidity, conditional love, melancholy, and sadness. It can also flow with great swings of uncontrollable emotion. Maybe a lot of crying. Let's move to Pingala. Pingala is the right side of the face and the body. It channels the energy of prana and the solar energy, surya and rajas. Now here again, sometimes we think of a rajastic mind as being negative because it's forward thinking and aggressive. But we need action, don't we? We need action as part of this balance between tamas. We need action 
sometimes in many ways to bring about purification. This male energy, when purified, is responsible for the digestive process being efficient. You'll remember it in your Ayurveda lectures and from last week as Agni. Huh? This digestive energy, this heated energy within us. Sometimes people refer to it as uh, Kundalini energy even. I like to stick with uh, Agni. So Pinkala, when imbalanced, leads to confusion, inability to make decisions. You become maybe critical, overly logical, highly judgmental. Sometimes we can have great swings of passionate or intense heated emotion. This Pinkala is imbalanced. So the central channel, Shashuna, and there can be an SH if you like to put an SH after it, but uh, this could be a good way of spelling it, S-U-S or S-U-S-H, either one. It's the main nadi and it mirrors the spine line. It contains a lot of that fire energy, a lot of Agni. The practice of pranayama with a sattvic mind is what cleanses Shashuna Nadi. It's said that pranayama practice isn't effective. Any breathing practice isn't effective without a sattvic mind. Why? Because the central channel will be all mucked up. It'll have impurities. It'll have, you know, uh, all of the rajastic and tamastic that isn't good running through and so if you're try trying to channel this energy by retaining the in-breath or the out-breath, it'll be in haste. It'll not really be worth the time. So the first thing to pranayama practice is to start with a sattvic mind. Shishuna, when in balance, leads to dullness, ignorance, and decreased awareness. It also leads to oversensitivity to stimuli and sometimes over heightened awareness. It can lead to paranoia, hallucinations, and insanity. This is why the pranayama practice really isn't something to be played with, so to say. It really should be done very carefully, very slowly, with the help of a teacher. Now, as yoga therapists or as Ayurvedic practitioner giving yoga therapy, it's going to be important that you recommend really slow, and I'm going to use the word basic again, basic pranayama. Next week, we'll focus on specific pranayama practices, but really the pranayama practice we did at the beginning of this lecture would be sufficient for most people. Most people are not going to be able to even control the in-breath to a count of 10. 20 would be unheard of. So starting with just a five count would be best to just control the in-breath and be aware of it. Just allow yourself to connect with divine consciousness. It's enough of an activity. is enough for most people for many months, maybe even years. And then slowly you can add on the awareness of the outbreath and how the outbreath is cleansing and purifying. You may want to focus on nadi awareness. This would be the alternate nostril breathing, wouldn't it? We'll learn the alternate nostril breathing, nadi shodhana, next week, but for now, I'd like you to just close your left nostril with your pinky. Just close it softly. Don't press it too firmly. And breathe in and out, soft and slow. Remember, when you breathe in, you are divine consciousness. When you breathe out, you're cleansing. 
do this just a few more times. Inhale and exhale, just to the right. And soft and slow, release the hand. And how do you feel? You can share it if you like. And it's fine if you don't feel anything. Sometimes we won't, we won't at first. For most people, this pingala, my left nose is clogged due to sinus. My heart rate slowed down. Interesting. I always feel brighter when I focus on my breath. I love it. So the left nose is clogged due to sinus. It is okay to do it when having sinus. Or is it okay to do when having sinus? This is a yes, no, maybe so. How clogged are they? You know, is it a chronic condition or is it something that's just recent? If it's a chronic condition, the Nadi Shodhana should help it. Of course, the cleansing techniques like um, neti pot and so forth would help and all the other techniques of Ayurvedic practitioner that we know. As far as pranayama goes, if it's a chronic condition, we would work with it. So yes, it would be okay. If it's just something that's come up, maybe you just have a sickness, no, I wouldn't do it to them because then you're channeling kind of that sickness energy. We'd choose the other pranayama practices, okay? So that would be a no. So it's kind of yes, no, maybe so. But you might play with it if you're under the guidance of an experienced practitioner or if you've been doing pranayama yourself, Nadi Shodhana, for many years, you'll be able to tell if doing the alternate nostril breathing is beneficial or not. So there again, I have to kind of weigh my response based on who the individual is. Who is it? How long has it been? There are a lot more. So Sriya is saying, yes, it has been chronic. Then I would say the alternate nostril breathing would be very good for you. Now, before we go further, and I'm going to comment more on this chronic condition of sinus, clogged sinuses, Let's just take a moment to close the right nostril with the thumb. Remember, don't press down too firmly. And go ahead and breathe in. Connect to divine consciousness. And breathe out. Allow yourself to cleanse body, mind, and spirit. Breathe in your own pace and out at your own pace. Just a couple more times. Good. Now go ahead. I know it's only a few times. And go ahead and chat there and let me know what you felt. Was there a difference between the right and the left? Danae got a little lightheaded on the left. I am dizzy too. Calmer. So here we go. When, you, when we take more energy from Gretchen, it feels more calm and peaceful. Hello, Angel. Good. Now let me move up here. Let's see. Gretchen felt more energy. Let's see on the exhale. On the exhale, but your heart rate slowed down on the inhale. So what I'm going to say is you have a definite imbalance. This is just by listening to your breath or even getting a response from you. You have a definite imbalance of prana vayu, right? And obviously, apana vayu too. This is just from the feedback of your breath. We haven't even done any of the other diagnostic techniques that we have as an Ayurveda practitioner. The idea that you would get lightheaded or dizzy is troubling. This tells me there's a lot of ama, a lot of toxicity. This is, again, without any of the other tools we have as an Ayurveda practitioner. This is just talking pranayama practice as a yoga therapist. These are things you would look for if you were helping a client with the breath. It's always advised that if you get dizzy or lightheaded, if you get angry, any of those deep emotions, to just stop for a minute and let everything kind of 
settle down on its own before you start again. Now listen, this alternate nostril breathing we'll talk more about, but what I want to say in this context that we can work on Ida, Pingala, and Shishuna real easily. We could, for instance, Svirja, this is a chronic condition for you, and it looks like your left side's a little more clogged, is it? Or is your right one more clogged? Which one's more clogged, Svirja? Yes, left. So the left side is more clogged. So what we would do is she would take rest on her right side and sort of close up the energy on the right side so the left side could open up. Now remember, the left side is lunar, it's female. So I would give, and we'll get into meditation in the next couple of the lectures, but I would give meditations as a yoga therapist that would complement goddesses that would complement um, female energy. I would give asana practice that would complement the heart chakra. Now, why the heart chakra? Or why uh, Vyanavayu, if we think of it in this context? Because the heart is emotional, the left side is emotional, governs the heart and emotion, exactly. So, so do you see how I'm trying to sort of put together a protocol, a yoga therapy protocol for a client, just based on the way they breathe? I haven't even seen any of their asana practice, and I don't know about how they treat the world or how they treat themselves, the yamas, the niyamas. This is just by looking at the breathing. It's really powerful, this breathing practice for a yoga therapist as an Ayurveda practitioner. I'm going to caution you to go slowly with it. You know, when I started yoga, I had to search. I mean, I really had to scour the libraries for information on yoga. It was hard to come by. And of course, there wasn't inter internet then, right? So the internet's great and grand, but sometimes it, it's, it's kind of too much information. Too much without having uh, the spirit as a healer, as a therapist, as an Ayurvedic practitioner that's cultivated without really knowing the essence of what kind of a tool you have, this very beautiful tool of pranayama. Don't think that you would want to go start teaching immediately any of the rolling breathing exercises, for instance. So start simple. You can work on just the left and the right, just as I did with you. And then become aware if the client's more clogged on the left or the right. And you may have them hold down the side that was more open and breathe in just through the side that was clogged. And then at home, they could do their asana practice, one or two. And then they could lie down on the side that was open and just breathe. They don't even have to hold the nostril. They just breathe in that, in that, in that way. Now, now Svirja is starting to feel cooler near her lungs and her chest area. This is good information, and it would be really fun to take this over and through and through. With few more breaths, she says, it's slightly open on the left. Now, think, this has happened just in three or four minutes for Svirja. Think if she did this consistently every day. Remember, it's the consistency that's going to matter. So this is how we start the pranayama uh, therapy, so to speak. Very simply, with great awareness, with just the information you have. No need to go and Google 9,000 different ways of doing pranayama. This is good enough.
So only when the nadis are purified can the yogi practice pranayama successfully. So how do you clear the nadis? Well, the nadis are cultivated or clear nadis are cultivated in two ways. The shat karmas, and we talked about it in the yoga pancha karma workshop that we had a few months ago. But there are six actions, shat karma, six actions. It includes neti and kapabalati, basti, pratika, staring at objects, nali, the rolling breath, dauti, cleansing orifices with um, gauze or so forth. But the most important way, because who was it last week? Was it Nicole? She said, well, some of the things in the Hatha Yoda Pradipika, they're pretty extreme. And yeah, they can be seen as extreme, can't they? Are we going to tell clients, well, go take this piece of gauze and, you know, suck it in through your nose, let it come out through your mouth and clear the nadis? Well, no, we're not. You might tell someone who's been practicing for longer and is really adept at the practices to do this, but not a new client. But the one way that we can help cultivate clear nadis that's simple, that everyone can do, is just place the mind in a sattvic place. So what's sattva? What's sattvic? Have you had your class yet with a tool to know this? Go ahead and chat there. Sattva? So this can be thought of as a balanced place, yes, balanced state. It can be thought of as peace or calm. It's that place between rajas and tamas. It's funny to me because just about the time you get sattvic, it seems that you start thinking of the fact that you're sattvic. <laughs> and so you want to keep it just a little longer and so that thought of wanting to keep the sattvic space is, of course, rajastic, isn't it? <laughs> or maybe you come onto the mat or into your meditation cushion or wherever you practice pranayama, and you remember past times when you were in a sattvic place. Well, that's tamasic, right? Backward thinking, thinking of the past. So we have to be careful in Sawa that it's it's kind of a new and fresh experience every time. It's almost like Sawpik will be changing in some ways. Sometimes really sweet, sometimes just a sweet nectar. It's always sweet, no doubt about it. But it's never going to be based on something that you grasp for or remember of time past. It's really that place, I believe, of samtosha, the space of contentment. No matter where you are, no matter what's happening in your day-to-day -day life, to go to that space of contentment. Is being in the present moment sattvic? It's beautiful. Of course it is. Being in that present moment, just balanced and content, peaceful and calm. Remember, this is the way that we cultivate pure nadis. Remember, without pure nadis, pranayama is ineffective. So the first thing to do, excuse me, when we sit for pranayama or lie down, whatever it is you take, to allow the mind to be. And we can use sphergias. Uh, take on it, being in the present moment. There's so many ways we can express sattva. But remember, it's most important that it's not based on how you felt yesterday or how you want to feel again. It's just right here and now. Pure and sweet. This is what we convey to our clients. So, in order to preserve the balance of prana and apana, bandhas are used. Okay? Now remember, for me, prana is the energy contained in the in-breath, apana the energy contained in the out-breath. Prana moves, well, all over the body. But, believe it or not, I believe prana can move downward and upward 
of course. Apana too has to be directed based on how um, balanced everything else is, how balanced Agni is, how balanced the Vayus are, how balanced the mind is. This is pranayama practice, being able to feel this imbalance, so to speak, and then doing the exercises to balance. Okay? Let's talk about the bandhas. So bandhas, or bandha, is literally means joining together or bondage, fettering or catching hold. Bandhas provide more than a lock. Sometimes we think of bandhas as a lock, but really they distribute the flow of prana and apana, they irrigate the nadis, and they balance the subtle body and the chakras, the energy centers. We'll talk more about chakras in another class. So bandhas provide the basis for correct positioning in asana. Uh, last week I had a private client, and you know what, we, she's been practicing for a long time, and if you looked at this client of mine, you would say, boy, she's an advanced practitioner. She can do all the arm balances and all the headstands and all the handstands and, uh, you know, flat as a flitter in the forward bends and so on and so forth. But you know what we worked on for a whole hour? <laughs> Bandas. We stood in Tadasana, you know, the mountain pose, and we worked on Bandas. That's all. The whole hour. Why? Because the bandhas provide the basis for correct positioning in every asana. When you're connected with this um, hold, this lock of the various bandhas, there's no way the spine can be out of alignment. And when I teach yoga teacher training, this spinal alignment is of the utmost importance. It's important for Western physiology, but it's way more important for the flow of prana and apana through the nadis. All right? So mula bandha. Mula means root. Mula bandha forms an energetic relationship with the pubic bone and the sacrum. So it's almost like you're thinking you're bringing the sacrum forward and the pubic bone down and back. Mula bandha should be present in all asana practice. What I really should have put here is it's present in pranayama practice. Mula Bandha supports the spine. And let me go back to Mula Bandha. So let's take just a moment. Now listen, Mula Bandha is never really about contracting, but bringing awareness to this relationship of the pubic bone and the sacrum is going to be really difficult. For me, it took me seven or eight years to really get it, and still I work on it. And the first time I really got this connection of Mula Bandha and Uddiyana Bandha in the practice, I, I was nauseous after class, just whoo, it was crazy powerful. So I don't expect that we're going to get it here today, especially online in this manner, but I think that we can begin to uh, appreciate this relationship of uh, energy, this relationship of, of locking and controlling the energy at the lowest base of the spine. In the beginning, as I said, it should never be thought of, this Mulabandha practice, as a contracting of the musculature. However, to become aware of Mulabandha, at first we're going to have to contract, because that's kind of our only uh, pathway to awareness at first is this physical body and contracting and, and relaxing. And then over time, it'll become more subtle. But guess what? More powerful. So this is what we're going to do. I'd like you to hold in. What does that mean, hold in? For a man, it'll be as if you're trying to hold in urine, trying to keep from going potty, from urinating. For a woman, it's going to be a little bit like Kegel, and really it's going to be a little bit like holding the urine as well. Just try it. Just contract softly in the lowest portion of the belly, way deep down in the spine, the space where the perineum lies. I like to call it the space between the pooper and the pier for women. 
and try it again. You'll have to contract it first. It won't come naturally to anyone, I don't believe, at first. So this is the start of Mulabanda. Now, would it be wrong, would it be dangerous in any way to suggest to a client to practice this? I don't think so. Especially someone who had apanavayu, samanavayu, and even, even, even though it's opposite end, udanavayu vitiation. It wouldn't be wrong. It wouldn't be hurtful. It wouldn't create, um, you know, wouldn't create a problem. When I was teaching personal trainers, my first line of uh, business was to make certain no one got hurt. First, the trainer must not get hurt, so he has to have correct alignment when he's offering weights, for instance, to the client. Client, but then the client must be completely safe. So if I kind of use this rationale now with this yoga therapy, I'll say we must protect the patient, can't, shouldn't we? Our client, we must make certain that we don't offer things that could be hurtful. In my heart of hearts, I don't believe practicing Mulabanda in this way is hurtful. It'll bring awareness to this area, space between the pupa and the pier, the perineum, the space between the pubic bone and the sacrum, so that over time, over continuous practice, they'll be able to take the Mulabanda. Let's move on to Uddiyana Bandha. Uddiyana Bandha, uh, Uddiyana is flying upward. It moves energy from the lower chakras, over the lower base of the spine, into the heart chakra. It helps to purify the organs in the front of the lower spine and in the whole body as prana moves through Shishumna Nadi towards the heart chakra. For me, Uddiyana Bandha is very powerful. It's a little easier to feel. I like to feel this as taking the spine, the belly center, the belly button, to your spine. But you do this on the exhale. So breathe in softly just for a moment. And when you exhale, bring the belly to the spine. Softly release. And do it again. Exhale, belly to the spine. Just one more time, let the belly soften, and exhale firmly, belly to spine. Now, this is Uddiyana Bandha. Now, listen, when you get really adept at Mula Bandha, Uddiyana Bandha, you hold Mula Bandha on the in-breath 100%, and then you release it about 80% as you transfer it into Uddiyana Bandha. So, Mula Bandha will always be present about 20%. Uddiyana Bandha, you can control as you like, but it, it will pretty much release 80 to 100% when you release your exhale. And once again, could we practice this Uddiyana Bandha? Who would Uddiyana Bandha be good for? Just Uddiyana Bandha with the exhale. Who would this be good for? Balancing what values, which agni, what? What would this be good for? Maybe even which ailment? Well, we could think of constipation. Yeah, just our agni and samanavayu. Of course, very good. Apanavayu as well. There you go. So this is how we start to think and put it all together. Depression. I'm going to say Rishi, this is a yes, no, maybe so one. Because I believe that depression can be two sided. What does that mean? Body and mind. Huh? So, yes, Tamasika mind and Apanavayu vitiation. Would Udanavayu be best for Apana? Yes, no, maybe so. We have to be careful with the stuff that concerns the mind. Why? Because 
uh, Jalandhara Bandha, which comes up next, is going to be a very strong gateway pathway to the mind specifically. So what I would say, Rishi, is connecting Uriyana Bandha with Jalandhara Bandha, which coming up next, would be better than just Uriyana Bandha by itself. Because then you could control the flow more, the energetic flow into the brain. And it's not just coming away from the brain or into the brain so quickly. Does that make sense? You don't want to take someone who's depressed and pour a bunch of happy juice on them. You know, that'll shock them. That would be doing Uriana Banda without Jalandara Banda. So I hope I, I bring that. Yes, balance, not euphoria. Exactly. So you have, yes, you're on the right path, but we have to make sure we couple it with Jalandara Bandha. And Anha, your right pranavayu, center of your chest. Because remember, it nourishes and brings energy to the heart chakra. Okay? Manavaha Shota, there's another one, right? Sarapitta. But that's really going off on a tangent. I'm going to keep it just simple for now. Jalandhara Bandha. This means a net, a mesh, or a web. Jalandhara Bandha redirects prana to intended areas. It aligns the cranial bones and helps open and relax the chest and shoulders. It's beneficial for any condition that affect the torso, the neck, and the head. In my view, so it's my hope and uh, my practice in the future as an Ayurveda practitioner, to um, work with psychiatric or uh, patients of Draha. And in my view, Jalandhara Bandha is really, really beneficial for conditions that affect the mind. Now let's think of Jalandhara Bandha. Give me a second here. Let's see. Let's think of Jalam Darabanda as a kind of tucking in of your chin towards your neck or your chest. Now listen, it isn't bowing the head. The, the neck portion, the cervical spine, should really stay straight. What I like to do is um, you can think of that center core of a toilet paper roll. You can get something about this size, maybe a tiny little water bottle, those water bottles that are only eight or ten ounces, and you can put it right underneath your chin and hold it there without rounding the, the neck. Of course, you're not going to round the rest of the spine either. That's why we practice the asana, so we could sit in pranayama. Everything's straight. And if you can't hold it straight, shashunanadi, the spine, cervical spine, jalandhara, bandha, then use the wall lie down or put your legs up the wall. Get a, a chair, but the spine must be straight. So Jalandhara Bandha redirects prana to intended areas, aligns the cranial bones. Now, what does this mean, align the cranial bones? So the bones in our head move too? And this gentle rhythm, just gentle flowing of breath, brings a passive realignment to the bones in the head, relieves tension that people can feel when they're stressed out, when they're anxious. Really, really beneficial. So let's practice it. See if you can get your spine line really straight. And then just gently tuck your chin. Remember, you're not going to bow the chin forward. And just hold there, inhaling and exhaling. Now, Jalandhara Bandha probably is the second most difficult after Mula Bandha. You could have clients sit up against the wall and lengthen the cervical spine and tuck their chin. It's a really easy way to do this. 
were on, when they are on the floor, you can have them tuck their chin in. And of course, we learned all the asanas that have Jalandhara Bandha. We're not going to go into that. You already know them. So you could give them an, an asana with a few deep breaths or soft breaths, whichever you're trying to uh, cultivate, energy or relaxation. And that would uh, take care of your Jalandhara Bandha. But Jalandhara Bandha with pranayama, with any kind of breathing exercise, can be used on its own, or as I was explaining to Rishi, with other bandhas. In the full of the practice, let's say in a vinyasa practice, remember vinyasa just means to set carefully. I'm not talking about the flow, just anything, that we set carefully the body. You will be using Mula Bandha, Uriyana Bandha, Jalandhara Bandha, every pose. So this is where the effectiveness, this is where the power and the strength, the beauty and the softness of pranayama comes in. Understanding the flow of energy through the nadis, understanding that there's energy contained in the in-breath, energy contained in the out-breath, that we kind of um, corral it in the way that suits us both or suits the client. huh? What are you trying to accomplish as a practitioner? And then what is the client able to handle? Danae asks, spine straight as in straight or keep the natural curvature straight? It's difficult to keep the natural curvature straight if you uh, take Mula Bandha. So the answer is straight. There'll be a tiny natural curvature, you know, in the in lumbar. And, you know, slightly outward in the thoracic, but when you're holding in Mula Bandha, that action of the pubic and the sacrum coming together straightens out that uh, curvature in the, in the lumbar. Not completely straight. Don't go overboard. Just a little. Okay? So begin to bring your breath under control and drink deep of divine love. This is in the Upanishads, a beautiful statement. As you bring your breath under control, and allow your mind to become peaceful. Tell yourself, I'm peaceful, I'm sattvic. Slowly begin to connect with divine consciousness. Remember that energy you bring in on the in-breath is divine energy. Breathing in, feel the essence of divine spirit within you. Focus just on the in-breath for now. Two more times, inhaling. Feel the essence of divine spirit. Now begin, on the exhale, to release all of which does not serve you today. Physically, release pain. Spiritually, release doubt. Mentally, release anxiousness, anger. All that exists now is peace and calm. All that exists now is a sophic mind. Two more times, just focus on the exhale. Focus on being peaceful and kind. Focus on this sattvic mind. Now stay with me. On the next exhale, hold the breath for five counts. 
as you hold the breath, notice the flow of mental activity slowly. Now inhale, soft and slow divine consciousness, and exhale, sattvic mind. Hold once again and notice the flow of mental activity slowing. Once again, inhale divine consciousness. And exhale, release all that does not serve you. Hold at the bottom, five, and release. Know that in this moment, you are sopic. Know that in this moment, you are peace. Know that in this moment, you are love. Know that you are one with divine consciousness. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll see you in forum. Namaste.